right, so please stand and join us as we do our opening song. These lovely ladies lead us in majesty. <laughs> all right, we're ready. We're all watching. I don't remember. Majesty, worship his majesty. Unto Jesus be all glory, honor, and praise. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. All right. That church family, man, we're blessed. Okay. Tonight, I had Brother Daryl Reed out of Second Peter. We had your your Bibles by now are probably falling open to Romans chapter ten. Uh, it, this is a verse that I believe is congruent with the whosoever's and congruent with uh, whosoever confesses, whosoever shall call upon. It's congruent with these scriptures and in this series in this vein that God takes notice of every person on the planet. And, and though it's been 2,000 years since the ascension of Jesus Christ, know this. God is patient. Thank God for his patience. Amen. Amen. And he's not slack concerning his promises. Let us read 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9 again. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, does that mean, does that mean all will come to repentance? No. No. It's his desire that every man and woman, boy and girl, come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and enter into a relationship with God the Father through God the Son. But not everyone will. But those whosoever's that call upon the name of the Lord. Tonight we're going to be looking at uh, the most, if not one of the most, wicked kings Judah ever had. Let's talk about Judah first. Judah was the southern kingdom uh, that made up the two parts of the nation of Israel. Israel was known as the northern kingdom. The southern kingdom, or the southern part of Israel as a nation, was called Judah. Judah was the seat of worship. Judah is uh, where Jerusalem was. Judah is where the temple was. So Manasseh, this king that we're going to be talking about tonight, Manasseh being the king of Judah and being known even now as one of the most wicked kings that Israel and Judah ever knew, sat on the throne of David in the midst of the seat of the worship of God's people. This is uh, tonight's uh, uh, lesson, if you will, tonight's message, if you will, is that whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord, even those we would consider the most wicked, if they are truly repentant in their heart, they shall be saved. But what damage do they do and what sins are done in between time? How are we and what are we to think of God? Well, we shouldn't, surely shouldn't think him slack concerning his promise. Why? Well, Peter tells us. We, we shouldn't, shouldn't think that he's an absentee landlord or that he's turned his back on us or turned his back on this wicked person. 
The fact of the matter is, we're going to read tonight in the book of Psalms, that God is known for His judgments. And know this, judgment is coming. One way or another, God will not be mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, so shall they reap. Turn with me back to 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles in chapter 33. 2 Chronicles in chapter 33. We're going to read about Manasseh. I was telling Judy today, I said, you know, Judy, this, this uh, wicked king, he came, uh, he came to uh, prominence. He came into rule and reign as the king of Judah at 12 years old. And Judy said, can you imagine what kind of kid he was? And then I had to remind her, he was Hezekiah's kid, Austin. And Hezekiah now is known the exact opposite of Manasseh. Hezekiah was known as the righteous king. And then I said, but that's not even the craziest part. Are you ready for this? If you're ready for the crazy part, say, yep. yep. Okay, good. we got three people here. <laughs> that's a redneck amen. This boy, this boy Manasseh, this wicked king, he, he was born in the 15 years that Hezekiah had asked God to extend his life. That's crazy. See, uh, Hezekiah had a gorder on his neck. He was going to die. And uh, Isaiah, the prophet, comes in and tells him, oh, yeah, you're going to die. That's my paraphrase. Hezekiah, it says Hezekiah turned to the wall bitterly and wept. And he asked God for an extension on his life. And halfway through the courtyard, God tells Isaiah, okay, go back, tell Hezekiah. I'll give him another 15 years. In that 15 years, Manasseh's born. Now, you want to know something that's even crazier than that? Say, uh-huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> I like it. Well, it's good tonight. It's going to go out on the radio. They're going to say, man, that's a cowboy church or something. <laughs> Not only... In the extension of, of Hezekiah's life, the righteous king is the most wicked king born. But are you ready? According to extra-biblical tradition, that prophet that's talked about in Hebrews chapter 11 that was sawed in two in the middle of an emptied log, that was Isaiah. So God first gives Isaiah the message to go tell Hezekiah, you're dying. Then he stops him and says, no, go back and tell him I'm going to give him another 15 years. And then the boy that's born in that 15 years grows up to kill the very prophet that brought the good news to Hezekiah. Can this one be forgiven? Can God forgive this one? And why would God even have him born? Well, the ways of God are not our ways, that's for sure. But we know this, it's by the grace of God any of us even walk the planet. Ah, and God's grace is amazing, but he is known for his judgments. Chapter 33, 2 Chronicles, verse 1. Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 50 years in Jerusalem. 50 and 5 years, that makes him 67 when he dies. Two years past retirement. Poor guy didn't even get to collect Social Security. For he built again, uh, excuse me, verse 2, but he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. This isn't, this isn't any kind of common evil. It says that like unto the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. For he built again the high places, which Hezekiah his father had broken down. And he had reared up altars for Balaam, and made groves, and worshipped all the hosts of heaven, and served them. Also he built altars into the, in the house of the Lord. It wasn't bad enough that he was serving and worshipping pagan idols, but he built altars to the pagan gods within the temple of God. Let's go, let's go on. It says, uh, He also built altars in the house of the Lord, wherefore the Lord ha had said, in, Jerus in Jerusalem shall my name be forever. Remember, he's in the seat of the heart of worship there in Jerusalem. And he built altars for all the hosts of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. 
And he caused his children to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom. Let's talk first about these altars to the hosts of heaven. I get wind, some people every now and again still looking at their horoscopes, and yet they've been bought up out of this world and into the heavenlies. If you're looking at your horoscope, if you're talking about what sign you are, what I want you to know is you're participating in pagan idolatry. So when I tell somebody I was born on March 12th, and they go, hey, Pisces, we're two of a kind. I go, no, we're not, not even like each other, because I, <laughs> I don't consider myself a Pisces. I consider myself a child of God. Amen. Matter it not what month you're born in. Matter it only if you've been born again by faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. So know this. If you are looking at the horoscope on your Facebook, you are practicing in pagan idolatry. And it will lead you into witchcraft. And it will lead you away from God. We are not. We are not to try and discern the future. We are not to try and disseminate uh, our path. We are to lean on God and not trust in our own understanding. Amen or oh me? Amen. Good, I'm glad. So it says that, yeah, he, he built these altars even to the hosts of heaven. And he caused his children to pass through the fire of the valley of the son of Hinnom. This was child, child sacrifice. So when it talks about the abomination that Manasseh took part in, and it was even worse or likened unto the abomination of the people that God had cast out, something I want you to take home tonight is don't feel sorry for those poor little Canaanites. Don't feel sorry for the, those poor little Hittites. God had given them 500 years to repent. Uh, God cast them out because they were, they were ic, uh, evil continually before the sight of God. It wasn't uncommon for either one of those cultures to take their firstborn child, sacrifice it through the fire, then take the remains and bury it in the walls of their home that they might have good fortune. See, I liken it to modern-day abortion. Because after all, if you have a child out of wedlock or if you have a child in the wrong socioeconomic status, you're not going to have good fortune. After all, you need an education. W would that somebody had educated you enough to keep your legs shut Oh, we got real. Say, uh, well, uh, uh, pastor, I'm pro-choice. Me too. I'm pro-choice. You could choose to abstain. You can choose for adoption. You, you don't have to choose to kill your child. So, boy, that's a real condemning message. Only if you won't repent. See? Because whosoever, even the one who's had an abortion... Whosoever, even the one who's had an abortion, should call upon the name of the Lord. A broken and contrite heart he will no wise cast out. They can be saved and forgiven. It is not the unforgivable sin. The only unforgivable sin is to deny Jesus Christ. That's when you die in your sins. You carry that sin as well as the rest of the baggage like a freight train with a thousand carts behind it right into the pits of hell. Ah, but see, through the blood of Christ, like a heaven-bound eagle, you fly right into the arms of Jesus. Amen. No baggage, no nothing. Forgiven, justified, redeemed, and one day glorified. If that doesn't get you fired up, I don't know what will. Even this rascal, could you forgive him? What if it was your nephew, your niece, that he sent through the fires? Could you forgive him? Well, thank God for his patience. Thank God that he's slow to anger, quick to forgive. Let's keep reading about this, this one who did these abominations before God. He caused his children to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom. Also, he observed times and used enchantments and used witchcraft and dealt with familiar spirits and with wizards. Uh, he wrought much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him for anger. I remember when Harry Potter was super duper um, uh, popular. 
And, and I remember all the enlightened parents telling me, well, it's just, it's just a story if you just read it for the education. Yeah, but what you don't know is, is the author researched real witchcraft and put real spells in the book. Now, she doesn't believe in them. She thinks they're hocus pocus. Fact of the matter, I've heard tell that the author of Harry Potter is a Christian. Odd to me, but still, she thinks she's writing a book of fiction. Funny how Christians can be used of the devil. He said, boy, you're one of those, uh, you're one of those real prudes. Bet you don't let your kids even watch science fiction. No, I don't let them watch science fiction. I don't let them do anything anymore. They're grown. They do whatever they want. But when they were young, I, I started to try and limit what they watched. Too late. Too late, really. Should have started earlier. But what I will tell you is, is this, is that the world is, is constantly feeding through a small drip. Uh, witchcraft, enchantments, sorcery, uh, necromancy into the minds of your children and probably into your home. Probably into your home. It's in their cartoons. It's in your television shows. It's even in the superhero movies. All of this worldly enchantment and philosophy is all in there. Very, you won't ever see Jesus Christ in there. You'll never see the things of God in there. But you'll see all these other things. And these are the things that Manasseh dove himself into. He didn't just dive himself into it, but he bathed in it day and night. From the time he was probably 13 until the time he was about 50. And he did that which was abominable unto God. But he's a whosoever. Goes on to say in verse 7, And he set a carved image, the idol of which he had made. He had made. This, he made this image himself. He had made in the house of God, of which God had said, said to David and to Solomon, his son, In this house, in this house, in Jerusalem, which I have chosen, be, uh, chosen before all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. Neither will I no more remove the foot of Israel from out of the land which I have appointed for your fathers, says the Lord, so that they will take heed to do all that I've commanded them according to the whole of the law and the statutes and ordinances by, my, by the hand of Moses." He put the, the idol smack dab in the house that God put his name on. You know there's a house now that God has his name on. It's the holy temple of God. You say, oh yeah, but it's up on Sunrise Mountain. No, it's not. You're looking at it right now. If you look to your right and to your left, the born-again Christian, you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. God has placed His Spirit on you. His signet is now upon you. You are the temple of the risen God, Jesus Christ. So what idols do you place in your heart? Oh, I won't meddle too much tonight. Most of them are idols of your own making. They're the things you thought you needed. They're the things that your heart desired, not the things that God desired for you. I like the one that comes in talks to me about talks to me about their first husband or their first wife. And I go, "Okay, tell me all about it." So they tell me all about it. Then they begin to complain about their second spouse. And I say, "Well, did you ask the Lord for the first one?" Well, no. We were just kids. I guess that's supposed to excuse it. I said, well, "Okay, you're just kids." I go, "Now, how about the second one?" Well, I was 50 when I married them. Did you ask the Lord for the second one? Well, no, you know what? He had a nice car, good pension. Well, you get what you have not asked for. Amen? Well, no, we must seek the Lord's heart, and then we will get what he knows, which is best for us. Verse 9, so Manasseh made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to err. Now, remember I told you. God will forgive whosoever calleth upon his name. And God, in forgiving whosoever will call upon his name, uh, they will be forgiven and they can be restored. But check this out. They oftentimes can make many, many people err in between times. Here it says again that the inhabitants of, he made the inhabitants of Jerusalem to err and to do worse than the heathen whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. If you're going to be a, a disruption, sir? Okay, if you're going to be a disruption, you can... Okay. 
That's all right. Why don't you go on and sit back there? Thank you, sir. That's all right. I tell you, God must be about doing something good. All right. We'll come on back. Mike, it's an adventure, isn't it? Hey, he can sit back there if you're going to be quiet. You're going to be quiet? Okay, sit. Okay. Remember, remember that thing? Sit, Ubu, sit. Okay. So we're back. So Manasseh uh, made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to err and to do worse than the heathen whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. Know this, it all begins and ends with leadership. My wife's, uh, my wife's mother was a music teacher in this valley for the school district for, I don't know, 25, 30 years, Ken. Got her, she had her master's in music. Woman, uh, she's one of the only people and the only prodigies to ever play for Liberace. He, she played for Liberace in private performances. She would tell us about the schools that she would work in. And you know what she said invariably? It begins and ends with leadership. If the principal is some loosey-goosey, wish-washy, jello-spined educator, <laughs> the school will be a joke. But if there's leadership that takes responsibility, that is seeking the best for children, to making sure that they can read, they can write, and they know their arithmetic. She said these schools were not only a pleasure to teach in, but you, you ready for this? This is going to be something that will shock you. She said the children even learned in. It all begins and ends with leadership, folks. So Manasseh, Manasseh, this wicked king, his wickedness caused all those in the nation to err. Now, we, we don't call our pastors to be wicked leaders, but we don't want them to have a backbone either. We don't want the teachers of our classrooms at, at the church, especially, to ever point out Johnny or Susie, because if we do, we're going to damage their, their inner child. Well, here's the thing. The, the church is supposed to be raising up godly men and women. And if we don't teach them, who will? And you say, well, what about their parents? Well, the church is supposed to be supplemental to what's going on at home. But let's face it, most of the stuff that's going on at home, well, let's just put it this way. That's why they're here. Amen? And I'm not trying to be ugly because I'm going to tell you that's why I came. I came because I was totally blowing it. And then I came and I found out I'm not going to have much more help here. I better get better. And that's what God did. Well, let's keep moving on. And the Lord spake to Manasseh and to his people, but they would not hearken or they would not obey obedience. Can you believe it? Wherefore the Lord brought upon them the captains of the hosts of the king of Assyria, which took Manasseh among the thorns and bound him with fetters and carried him to Babylon. God takes this wicked king, bounds him in chains, Amongst the thorns. And the, the word picture here is technically they have beaten him. He has been scourged. And they take him back to Babylon. This whorish city. This place that will be revived if it has not already. They take him back there. And in doing so, God is glorified. You say, how is God glorified? I, I thought that... I thought he did abominations in the land. Well, turn with me, if you will, to Psalms. Psalm chapter 9. Psalm chapter 9 in verse 16. Psalm chapter 9 in verse 16 says, The Lord is known by the judgment which he executeth. The wicked is snared in the work of their own hands. Yes, God is glorified. He's glorified in this. Manasseh didn't get away with it. Manasseh didn't get away with it. And neither did the people of Judah. Instead, he executed judgment on them. And the rest of the world watches. Remember, one of the things that started uh, this series 
was the fact that it came bubbling out of my mouth that judgment starts first at the house of God. And judgment came to my home. And I said, oh, Lord, we got some cleaning up to do. And surely we will always be doing some amount of cleaning in our life. But how much cleaning up needs to be done within the church? Now, I can't talk about y'all. I can talk about some. I think for the most part we're walking right. But we must continue to walk right. But it begins and ends with the leadership. First and foremost, we know who the leader of the church is. That's Jesus Christ. He always walks right. And then it goes to the pastorate. And the pastorate, uh, it's not that it's a, a downward slope from there. It's shoulder to shoulder. It goes pastor, teacher, deacon, servants, congregant. For what purpose? Well, to glorify God. But he's going to be glorified whether we walk right or not. Trust me. Because though he is slow to anger, his judgment is firm. And he is known by his judgments. Did you not read that? In Psalm chapter 9, verse 16, I'm glad. He's also known by his grace. Amen. Amen. Oh, thank God for your grace and your mercy, Lord. It goes, and when he, when Manasseh was afflicted, he besought the Lord his God. Now, that's funny. He besought the Lord whose God? Manasseh's God. Even though he had gone away. Even though altar after altar, Ashtoreth after Ashtoreth, ba Balaam after Balaam, wooden idol after wooden idol was built up and set in the... God was still his God. And in his affliction, he turned to him. Now, I, I want to remind you that there's no better place than in the dark of your life to turn to God. There's no bad place really to turn to Him. Every day is the day of salvation. Amen? Amen. One day, that, those days are going to end. I ask you tonight, are you saved? Who, who do you walk more like? Hezekiah or Manasseh? Well, you're here on a Wednesday night, so we got a bunch of Hezekiahs, I bet. Or maybe we have some Manassehs in the midst of their affliction. And they remembered the Lord their God. I want to tell you this. Well, you, whether you remember him or not, he never forgets you. He says, Wherefore the Lord brought up the captains. That was verse 11. Verse 12. When he, Manasseh, when his, was in his affliction, he besought the Lord his God, and he humbled himself greatly before God, the God of his fathers. And verse 13 says something. And he prayed to him. And he prayed to him. And he was entreated of him. And he heard his supplication and brought him again to Jerusalem, into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. Turn with me to Psalms chapter 51 and 17. Psalm chapter 51 and 17. Let's see if the word of God is congruent. Psalms 51 and verse 17, I, I quote it often in paraphrase. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O God, thou will not despise. Thou will not cast out. Manasseh had come to the end of himself. God is not slack concerning his promises. He is slow to anger and quick to forgive. But know this. The consequences of Manasseh's sin continued to reverberate. Though he had been forgiven, though he had been brought back and restored to his kingdom, let us keep reading and see what the influence, the influence of Manasseh's wickedness had had on those around him. He prayed unto him, and he was entreated unto him, and he heard his supplication, and brought him to Jerusalem and unto his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew the Lord, that the Lord, he was God. Now after this, he built a wall without the city of David. Oh, there was a change in Manasseh. He starts to get hot for the things of God. He built the wall about the city of David, the west side of Gihon. 
in the valley, even entering in at the first gate, encompassed about Ophel, and raised it up very great uh, to a very great height, and put captains of war in all the fenced cities of Judah. And he took away the strange gods and the idols out of the house of the Lord, and all the altars that he had built in the mount of the house of the Lord and in Jerusalem, and cast them out of the city. It even says he repaired the altar of the Lord and sacrificed there on peace offerings and thank offerings and commanded Judah to serve the Lord God of Israel. Nevertheless, the people did sacrifice still in the high places, yet unto the Lord their God only. They still sacrificed outside of God's proposed and commanded places of worship understand this half obedience is wholly disobedient does that make sense we must be holy gods when you call upon the name of the lord you're doing it as a whosoever and he hears whosoever calls upon him but know this i'm not a used car salesman Uh, i'm not selling I'm not selling shoddy goods. Fact of the matter is, I'm not selling anything. I'd like to give you something tonight. Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, loves you. And He wants you to make Him the Lord of your life. All you need to do is call upon Him. Call upon His name. To love Him. To trust Him. And are you ready? To obey Him. He says, if you love me, you will do as I command. If you love me, you will obey me. What are the two greatest commandments? To love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, thy mind, and thy strength. And to love your neighbor even as yourself. Now, if you're not into either one of those things, you're not going to be into Jesus. Because see, Jesus loved the Father and was obedient even unto death. And he loved his neighbor so much that he went willingly to the cross. And yes, lordship may cost you your life. More than likely it won't. But it did cost Jesus his. 